everybody. So um, now we're going to talk about conditional statements. Conditional statements are statements of the form if something, then something else. Like if uh, you study hard in this class, then you will get an A. Or if I, uh, I'm not careful when I'm driving, then I'm going to have an accident. And these are completely fundamental to logical reasoning. This is how we sort of move from one truth to another. And uh, so while, but they, as conditional statements are so fundamental, they appear in English in many, many different forms. And sometimes it takes a little bit of thought to puzzle out what's actually going on. So whereas I think and, or, and not are pretty straightforward, um, if then is a little bit trickier. So let's, uh, let's take a look and see what we can figure out here. So as I mentioned, the, the basic structure of a conditional statement is we start with two statements, P and Q, that we're going to combine. They could be anything. And remember that they could also be true or false. Statements are either true or false, but we can manipulate them regardless of whether they're true or false, and then ask at the end whether what we've done gives us when it's true and when it's false. So. Um, we start with two statements, P and Q, and then we make a new statement of the form, if P, then Q. That's the basic form. So I've got two examples here. If it is raining, that's my statement P, then it is cloudy. That's my statement Q. Now, could be true, could be false. Obviously, it depends on whether P and Q are true or false, but let's for the moment just think about the grammar of it. And here's another example. If a number is divisible by six, then it is even. So again, here we have a statement P, and here we have a statement Q, and we've combined them together to make a new statement out of both P and Q. The symbol for this construction is this arrow. So if you see P arrow Q, this is the statement, if P, then Q. So in an if-then statement, the, the basic idea is that the truth of the force, that for, for such a statement to be true, for an if-then statement to be true, it must be the case that the first statement forces the truth of the second statement. So for example, when I write, if it is raining, then it is cloudy. So here the statement P is it is raining. And the statement Q is it is cloudy. And if I say that if the statement, if it is raining, then it is cloudy, is true, I think what I'm trying to say in, in, in the English sense is that the fact that it's raining forces it to be cloudy. So we should certainly agree that if the first statement is true, so if P is true, that's going to force Q to be true. So if we're going to try to figure out what the truth table for this looks like, we can make a little diagram here. So this is going to be a valid conditional statement. If P is true and Q is true, that's good, right? Then it, the statement is true. So in other words, remember that there's the statement P and there's the statement Q. And then there's this third statement, if P, then Q. So if P is true and Q is true, then if P, then Q is true, because we're in the situation that the truth of the falsehood first statement does, in fact, force the truth of the second. If P is true and Q is false, then we're in a situation where the claim that we're making, if it is raining, then it is cloudy, isn't true, because we it, it, clearly the, tr the truth of the first statement has not forced the truth 
truth of the second statement. So for example, if I wrote, if a number is divisible by six, then it is divisible by 12. Um, it's not the case that being divisible by 6 forces you to be divisible by 12. 6 isn't divisible by 12. So in this case, the implication must be false. What if the first statement is false? This is where things get interesting, because if the truth of the first statement is supposed to force the truth of the second statement and the first statement is false, well, then the whole thing says nothing. I mean, it doesn't matter what the second statement is. It could be true or false. And it's still the case that the truth of the first statement first forces the truth of the second statement. It's just that the first statement is false. So. In both of these cases, the statement, the implication is considered true. And this is, I think, maybe one of the most confusing uh, things in logic, that in an implication, if P then Q, if P, the first statement, the hypothesis, is false, then regardless of the truth of the conclusion, the whole statement is true. OK, because these. Um, Conditional statements are so important. It's, uh, it's good to think about them from several different points of view. And the book has a nice way, I think, of talking about this. So this is actually, uh, this discussion here, it follows an example in, in chapter 2.3. And we start with two statements. Uh, you pass the final exam is statement P, and you pass the course is statement Q. And we want to think about the statement if P then Q. And the book suggests thinking about this statement as a promise. So it's a promise maybe from the professor that if you pass the final exam, you will pass the course. So, so um, this is a promise. If you pass the final, then you pass the course. And so now there's there's four possibilities about what can happen. Um, you can pass the final and pass the course. You can pass the final and fail the course. You can fail the final and pass the course. And you can fail the final and fail the course. Those are the four possibilities. And here's the statement, P implies Q. If P, then Q, which we're thinking of as a promise. And we want to think about the truth or falsehood of this statement as, is this a promise or was, was the professor lying or were they telling the truth when they made this promise? So if you passed the final exam and then and you pass the course. Was the professor telling the truth? Well, yes, the professor said if you pass the final, then you pass the course. So the professor was telling the truth. So this is a true statement. What about if you pass the final, but you don't pass the course? That's what TF means. Well, then was the professor telling you the truth? No, the professor was lying because the professor said, if you pass the final, then you pass the course. And you did pass the final, but you didn't pass the course. So here it was a lie. So the statement is false. The, the, the promise was a false promise. Suppose you fail the final exam. Well, if you fail the final exam and pass the course, did the professor lie to you? No, because the professor didn't make any promise to you under the condition that you fail the final exam. So since the professor told you the truth, this is a situation in which we give the value T. And finally, if you failed the final and failed the course, did the professor lie to you? No, because the professor only promised that if you pass the final, then you pass the course. 
he or she didn't say anything about what happens if you fail the final. So again, that's not a, that, that statement is a truth. So from this point of view, maybe that helps to explain why the only situation in which you catch the professor in a lie, so the only statement in which the if P then Q statement is, the only situation in which that statement is false, is the statement in which the hypothesis, the P statement was true, namely you passed the final, but the conclusion, the Q statement was false, namely you failed the course. And so that's the only situation in which that statement is a lie, and therefore that's the only situation in which the combined statement, if P then Q, is false. Now, um, because these things come up so often in, in conversation and in the English language, there are in fact many ways in English and in other languages as well of expressing a conditional statement. For example, if you start with, this is the most basic one, if P then Q, but it's possible to also say, for example, Q if P. So let's, let's say this, this one is, if you pass the final, then you pass the course. So this is P, pass the final, Q, pass the course. You could also say in English, you pass the course, if you pass the final. Notice there's no then in this statement, but the meaning is the same. Or you could say, you pass the course whenever you pass the final. Whenever is a fancy word for if. <laughs> you could also say, you pass the course provided that you pass the final. So in other words, someone might come to my office and say, am I going to pass this course? And I'll say, well, you'll pass the course provided that you pass the final. But from a, um, as far as the meaning goes, that's the same as my saying, if you pass the final, then you pass the course. Remember, I said whenever is a fancy word for if. So you can say whenever you pass the final, then also you pass the course. And then finally, uh, you'll sometimes see this, um, this uh, phrase sufficient condition used. P is a sufficient condition for Q, so in our case, you might see somebody saying, passing the final is a sufficient condition for passing the course. So sufficient means enough. So you might also see somebody saying, it's enough to pass the final, to pass the course. And here the meaning again, the, the, the notion of it being enough or it being sufficient, if you go back to the truth table, What this is saying is, um, if this statement here is true, if P implies Q is true, and you pass the final, that's P, then that's enough to conclude that you pass the course. So if, if, if passing the final is, a, if this is a true statement, P implies Q is a true statement, and you pass the final, then you pass the course. Another way to think about this is that 
if when I tell you if you pass the final, then you pass the course, there might be other ways to pass the course besides passing the final. So passing the final is enough, but there might be some extra credit way that you could pass the course. And so um, sufficient means that it's enough to guarantee. If you pass the final, it's enough to guarantee that you pass the course. Unfortunately, we're not done yet. You can also turn it around and you can say, for Q it is sufficient that P. In other words, to pass the course, it is sufficient or it is enough to pass the final. This is something you might say to a friend. How do you pass that course? Well, you could say, doesn't matter what the rest of the stuff is, it's enough to pass the final. And now, instead of saying sufficient, we could say we can use necessary, but you have to be careful about which, is, which statement is which. So here it says Q is a necessary condition for P. So that means passing the course is necessary to passing the final. We wouldn't normally think about it in this way because normally the, you think about, well, the final comes before the course. But what this means is that if you didn't pass the course, you must not have passed the final. So if you want to know, if you want to know if a person passed the final, um, you, have, you can look and see, did they pass the course? If they didn't pass the course, then you know that they didn't pass the final. If they did pass the course, they still might not have passed the final, right? So we can um, we can look at the truth table again. So P is the final and Q is the course. And P implies Q is this statement here written in this necessary and sufficient in this necessary way. And again, we assume that this column is correct. So this is true. So you see that to have passed the final, the only way that it's true that you pass the final, given that this is true, is that you must have passed the course. Because if you didn't pass the course, and this statement is true, then that would mean that you didn't pass the final. And we can go on and on here. Um, this one is another rewrite of this. For P, it is necessary than Q. I won't rewrite. I won't write that out now. But it would be to say, um, to have passed the final, it is necessary that you pass the course. If I want to know if you pass the final, I need to know. It's it's needed. It's necessary that you have passed the course. And finally, only if this one says that you pass the final only if you pass the course. And again, what this is saying is, if you didn't pass the course, you must not have passed the final. So one um, moral of this is that you have to be on the lookout in written text to identify not only what are the conditional statements, what are the if-thens which are buried in it, but which is the P and which is the Q, because they can appear in lots of different orders depending on how the connecting words are set up. So here's a few more examples. A matrix is invertible provided that its determinant is non-zero. So the statements here are a matrix is invertible and its determinant is non-zero. But which way does the implication go? Well, this is the provided that version, and it means that if you think about it, what it means is to tell if the matrix is invertible, you need to know if it's determined. You, you, it's enough to know that it's determined it is non-zero. So if we call this P and this Q, this sentence is actually saying that if the determinant is non-zero, then the matrix is invertible. 
Okay, so here's an only if construction. An integer is divisible by eight only if it is divisible by four. So this is the case where um, we have to worry about the meaning of this only here. And what it's saying is that um, if you're going to be divisible by eight, you have to be also be divisible by four. So this is a statement where this is P and this is Q. If an integer is divisible by eight, then it is divisible by four. The meaning here somehow is that um, you can't have an integer which is divisible by eight, but which is not divisible by four. So if it's divisible by eight, then it, it, that can only happen if it's divisible by four. Here's a sufficient use of sufficient. Being a native born citizen over the age of 35 is sufficient to be eligible to be elected president of the United States. So remember that um, sufficient means, so here's our P, it's actually a compound condition. And here's our Q, eligible to be elected president of the United States. So this is the case where being native born, this is from the US Constitution, and over 35 is, implies eligible to be elected. So one way to think about this is if you want to know if you're eligible to be elected, it's enough to check off the boxes that you're a native born citizen and you're over the age of 35. Once you've checked off those boxes, you know that you're eligible to be elected. And that's the sense in which those two, two conditions are sufficient. But what about necessary? So this one says being over the age of 35 is necessary to be elected president of the United States. So this one says, if you are elected president of the United States, then you are over age 35. Because the Constitution says you have to be over 35 to be elected president. And so if you want to know if you if you want to know if you could be if you've been elected president, you, you can be sure that you must have been an over 35. Otherwise, you couldn't have been elected president. So both of these necessary and sufficient things, I discussed them in the examples earlier. So you might want to just check back. Um, one piece of advice is just to avoid this terminology um, because it can be confusing. I sometimes get confused over which is necessary and which is sufficient. Uh, and one advantage when you're writing is that you can choose your own language and if you stick to simple forms like if or then, then if then, then you don't have to worry about some of these fancier things. But um, sometimes that gets boring and so people use other varieties. And so it's good to know all the different ways in which if then can appear.